there's some advantages to um, having the CT scan, some to having the biopsy. Once we think there might be pulmonary fibrosis, we certainly want to know how bad it is or how advanced it is. Um, you want to know what kind of effect it's having on the patient. Now, these are usually done before the biopsy, but either way, these are important parts. So we want to do a pulmonary function test. And pulmonary function testing, as you all know, consists of several parts. One is take a great deep, deep breath and blow as hard as you can into that machine. And uh, if Becky Alberti is still here, I can hear her sometimes uh, when I'm in a little conference room up in the pulmonary function lab uh, talking to the students, I can hear her in the back yelling, no, 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 But I, but she's not the only pulmonary function technician that does that. <laughs> That's exactly what we need. We want everybody to give it their absolute best so we can really find out how good their pulmonary function is. So what we're looking for is a restricted defect, that is a decrease in the size of the lung. A lot of other lung diseases, OPD, um, asthma, actually make the lung get a little bigger than it should be. And this one, the lungs are getting smaller. But it's true of all restrictive lung diseases, not just idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, all restrictive lung diseases. <coughs> so the amount of air, the total lung capacity goes down, and the amount that you can blow out from as full as you can get to as empty as you get from the vital capacity, that goes down in comparison to a age match, gender match, racial ethnic group table that tells us about what kind of pulmonary function values you should have. The range for any particular person, for somebody 50 years old, a man or a woman, for different tables for men and women, for heights, and for um, uh, their adjustments for African American and um, Asian groups, we can get an idea of what your pulmonary function should be. Plus or minus some. And 95% of all people ought to fill into that group. And if you're outside of that, then we say, that's probably abnormal. And the farther you are from the predicted value, the more abnormal we think it is. So we're looking at total lung capacity and vital capacity, how much you can blow out. And these are the best measurements of the size of the lung. We always measure how much comes out in the first second, FPV1, and we compare that to the total amount. Then we know in patients with pulmonary fibrosis, this ratio is usually increased. You can blow the air out fast. Not much comes out, but you can blow it out fast when you blow it. We also know that patients with pulmonary fibrosis will have low oxygen levels, and the test called a diffusing capacity, where we use a um, carbon monoxide, a very small amount of carbon monoxide, to help us figure out how efficient the lung is at picking up oxygen. So all of these things are typical of patients with pulmonary fibrosis or other kinds of fibrosis. But it gives us an idea of how severe the process is. Early on, normal pulmonary function testing does not exclude pulmonary fibrosis if there are other features that are typical of the disease, x-ray findings in particular, or biopsy. So it's not a diagnostic test. It is a test that tells us something about how severe the process is. We also measure what can you do. And the way we measure that is with a six-minute walk. And most places do it very much the same. You measure blood pressure, pulse, and oxygen saturation with the patient at rest. And then we put you on a course to walk as far as you can go in six minutes. And that is the primary task. How far can we go in six minutes? The rest of it's all extra. So it's a time to walk at the patient's pace. Um, it's not a test like forced vital capacity where we go more, 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 push, 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 push. We tell patients, walk as quickly as you can for six minutes. 
go as far as you can go for six minutes. If you have to slow down, that's okay, but I want you to go as far as you can go in six minutes. If you have to stop, that's okay, but the clock keeps running. So if you can start walking in, I want you to do that. How far can you go in six minutes? That's what the test is about. That's the primary end point. And it is a pretty good measure of heart lung function. So what kind of things throw it off? People who've got arthritis. Uh, people who have something that makes their mobility less good. If they have balance problems, this is not a great test. So we have to think of some things that are better in other situations. But this is common. Everybody's heard about prognosis. Um, I'm going to tell you that it's very nice. They have a site like Peter's, IPF today, that uh, concentrates on something other than these numbers. Uh, notice that IPF is, uh, has a better prognosis than lung cancer in terms of five-year survival, um, but it's worse than some other illnesses that we're not too happy about either. This does not mean that any individual patient is going to fit in this pattern. All it means is if you look at enough patients, there is this particular <coughs> truth that pulmonary fibrosis can take your, take your life. What do we do about it? There's just recently been a major gathering of um, pulmonary fibrosis experts. People from the United States, from Canada, from Europe, from uh, Japan, and from several Latin American countries. They all got together at a pulmonary fibrosis, if you will, summit. So all the important people who are actively involved in designing trials, conducting trials, uh, researching treatment, got together to look at all the information that's available about how should we be treating pulmonary fibrosis and come up with some kind of recommendations. And they covered a whole host of medications and other thoughts about pulmonary fibrosis. So this is a summary of that statement that was published uh, right at the end of last year, 2011. In terms of treatment, the group made strong recommendations against these drugs. So prednisone as a monotherapy, meaning by itself. They did not comment on prednisone in association with other therapy because it's too hard to consider the, uh, all the possibilities there. Colchicine, cyclosporin A, combined steroid with azathioprine and N-acetylcysteine. Interferon gamma, docentam, or Traclear, its trade name, and etanercept, a drug that's been used for various forms of cancer. <coughs> so these are all medications that have been tried in pulmonary function, and according to the experts, there's not enough good information to say, hey, we got a good one. That does not mean that people who receive these had problems with the medications, although some did. And it doesn't mean that some people didn't seem to get better. It just means in terms of statistics, there was not enough to show that treatment A was better than no treatment. Long list. There were three treatments down here at the bottom where their recommendations were weak, meaning that a lot of people in the group disagreed. Some physicians said, I think this really helps. Others looked at the information and said, I think you're making it up. <laughs> so, but there were people of great experience, great knowledge, who've been actively involved in this process who say, no, I really think perfenidone 
known in Europe and Canada as Esbria. Acetylcysteine, that's the NAC, which is a product you can buy in the health food store when it's available. And anticoagulation are beneficial to patients with pulmonary fibrosis. So there was great disagreement over these. And they, so they said, you know, we can't really say for sure, but in some patients it might be all right to treat with one of these drugs. Do I have an opinion? Yes. Uh, these are some things that we know are very beneficial. They're not really treatment for the disease, but they are beneficial. I'll, I'll come back. <laughs> yeah, they are the are things that we know that are important. If oxygen levels are low, that's not just a problem for the lungs, that's a problem for every part of the body. From the top of your head down to the bottom of your toes. Your kidneys, the liver, the brain, everything is struggling some under that situation. So everybody agrees that if oxygen levels are low, you should be on oxygen to get it back up there. Lung transplants for patients who are healthy enough to have them and sick enough to need them. The requirements, meeting the requirements for lung transplantation are all about that balance. Trying to make lung transplants available to people who are healthy enough to have a good chance of having a great outcome and not doing it too soon. Pulmonary rehabilitation is good. It makes the best of a bad situation. There's nothing that will improve shortness of breath better than pulmonary, re pulmonary rehabilitation. If you make your muscles more efficient, if you make your heart more efficient, and the best way to do that is with exercise, you can go longer before you fatigue with whatever the impairment is you've got in your lungs. This is a good thing. It's underutilized. Most, um, most were against treating for pulmonary hypertension, high blood pressure in the lungs, that's associated with IPF. Now that's not, not everybody agreed. This is a weak recommendation meaning that there was a lot of disagreement. <coughs> Most were against treating asymptomatic gastroesophageal reflux. If you've got a little heartburn, we don't know that it makes too much difference to be uh, on treatment. But it was a weak recommendation. And against mechanical ventilation, this means for those people who are sick enough for one reason or another, to need mechanical ventilation. This means you're, if we don't start mechanical ventilation, we think you're gonna die. 